Uh, Ms. Namrata Ajwani to welcome Dr. Naresh Dioli to inaugurate the very first session of the webinar series organized by the department. I, Ms. Namrata Ajwani, Head Department of Physics, RD National College, once again welcome you all for the international webinar series starting from today. Application of particle accelerators, just what we require in today's scenario. As we all know in today's time, when researchers from the entire world are searching for a vaccine against COVID-19, particle accelerators would mean a lot. Recently, it's said in news that Australia is using the largest particle accelerator, the synchrotron in Melbourne, to speed up the search for COVID-19 cure. The accelerator, according to the news, Let's the researchers construct an atomic level 3D map of the proteins so they can be used, the process can be used to develop drugs to treat this virus. The aptly chosen topic by the department, Dr. Milen Kulkarni has been working through and through for this yes. webinar series. Thank you, Dr. Naresh, for accepting our invitation. We welcome you all for giving us this webinar lecture. Before I continue and hand over the mic to Dr. Naresh, I would like to introduce the principal of RD National College. Dr. Neha Jaktiani, a well-known name in Mumbai Academia and PhD from SNDT University, is a member of Indian Merchants Chamber Education Committee and has a lot of research papers to her credit. Dr. Neha has chaired various conferences and presented numerous research papers at the national and international platforms. And her, has also written for global publications. A gold medalist from the University of Mumbai, she is a published author with two books to her credit. She has also received the Achievers Award for the year from Hind Sindhi Chamber of Commerce. As ma'am is a little occupied with other commitments, she has sent her best wishes for the webinar through a re recorded message. I would now requ uh, request Dr. Milen Kulkadi to kindly play the message. Thank you. The most powerful medicine on this earth is the human spirit. Good evening and a very warm welcome to the series of international webinars organized by the Physics Department, RD National College, in association with Institute Innovation Council and internal IQAC cell. I'd like to congratulate Dr. Milan Kulkarni from the Physics Department who has taken this initiative in organizing these webinars which go right up till June 14th, mid-June. I'd like to welcome all the participants who have enrolled for this. A special thank you to the Physics Department, headed by Ms. Namrata Ajwani, Vice Principal and IQAC Convener, Professor Dinesh Himatsingani. This webinar, these webinars are happening under the aegis of the Placement and Internship Cell of RD National College. 
I wish them all the success. Welcome everybody and happy learning. I conclude with what the famous Olympic gold medalist said, dreams require effortless sleep, whereas aims require sleepless efforts. Thank you. Shall I continue, Mirin? Yes, sir. Narissa, you can continue. All right. Uh, so, uh, as I was saying, the topic is over research with the particle accelerator. And uh, specifically, I work with uh, ion accelerators that operate at low MeV energy. We'll talk about that shortly. Uh, I have prepared this talk specif specifically to cater you guys. Uh, to incorporate as much as I can within this uh, short time to tell you what I have been doing, what I do right now, and what I pursue to do in near future. Um, my research has been funded uh, through the uh, Department of Physics at University of North Texas in past. Currently, it's being funded by University of Louisiana, NASA, and Board of Regents of the State of Louisiana. And we actively seek for uh, funding through various sources in, in the United States. So when people think of particle accelerator, they usually think of large hadron colliders or accelerators at CERN, which are considered to be the world's largest accelerator. But there are only few of them. Uh, so what is a particle accelerator? Well, it's a machine that employs electromagnetic field to propel charged particles. And by using electromagnetic fields, they can propel these charged particles to a very high speed. And when I say very high speed, it means a speed that is close to the speed of light. And that would give them a very high energy. And when they do that, they also contain them in a very small space, which is known as well-defined beam. Now, when you talk about particle accelerators like CERN or Large Hadron Collider, the image that I show you guys is uh, actually in a tunnel, which shows you a beam, uh, which would actually contain, when operational, a particle with uh, large, high speed and large energy. Uh, now, those tunnels are usually long, 27 kilometers to put a magnet. Uh, very expensive setup. Uh, which is not possible by a certain university or a certain institute or a single country, specifically different countries overtakes its project. I work with low MEV electrostatic ions. So a low MEV ion, electro, ion accelerator is a similar machine, like a smaller one. So it's a machine that employs electric to propel charged particles to very high speed and energy. Now, these speeds are lower than the speed of light, but they, are, they still contain the beam in, uh, in a very tight form, and that's why we call them a well-defined beam. Now, those heavy ion accelerators are, as you can see in the figure, picture is from my lab that I currently work in, it's like a cylinder, which is primarily the size of a room, a small room, you can say. Uh, mm -hmm. It's about could be about from anywhere from two to five meters long and about one to two meters wide, just the accelerator and the other components span over to a very large area in the room. Uh, the idea is that it uses a closely spaced equipotential ring that is connected to a resistor voltage divider. Now again, most of you would know what an ion is. Basically, it's an atom or a molecule that has a net electric charge. Now, I work with an accelerator that has to do with positive ions. And MeV is another term to uh, a unit for uh, energy, which is million electron volts. And you might know that one electron volt is the energy that is gained by an electron when it jumps to a potential difference of one volt. All right, I hope that you guys are able to hear me. <laughs> Yes, sir. We are. Yes, sir. We can hear him. Okay. Because I am at my maximum volume on the computer setting. Are you not seeing me? Go.
All right, so these are few applications of ion accelerator. Ion accelerator is basically used for ion matter interaction. This has to do with basic atomic physics where you learn about uh, interaction between ion and matter and the matter could be of any type of material. It could be a biomaterial, it could be a solid, it could be a liquid. It, is, it has been used for nuclear physics for a long time. It is heavily used for material analysis in today's era. And we try to use ion accelerators such as, uh, such as that I work with for space radiation simulation. I work with ion matter interaction, material analysis, and space radiation simulation. I haven't used, I use nuclear physics uh, in ion X. Uh, while using ion accelerator, but I don't uh, specifically do nuclear physics or perform research in nuclear physics when I'm using these ion accelerators. So these three are my area of research or well, one have been and two are current areas of research. The image that I show you here is the uh, old image of uh, my current lab. It, the lab keeps on modifying, uh, we keep on adding instrument to it, but mostly it contains the centerpiece of the equipment, uh, the centerpiece of the lab is the accelerator, the particle accelerator that you guys see in ion accelerator. It is manufactured by a company in US called National Electrostatic Corporation. It's one of the largest accelerator manufacturing uh, company in the world. There is another one in Europe and it is, it is known as High Voltage uh, Energy Europa, HVEE. So these two are the major uh, accelerator manufacturing company. NEC also supply accelerator to different institute in India. I think, I believe there are about three or four institute in India which have the, these type of accelerators, one being in Mumbai in TIFR, and it's bigger than this one. Now on the back side of the accelerator, behind, right behind the accelerator you see uh, some units tied on the floor. Now those units are ion sources, that's where we produce ion. That's where we produce these negative charged particles. So the idea is that you produce a negative charge particle which have modest energy. You can say the energy is in the range of uh, 10 to 30 kilo electron volts. So 10, 30,000 electron volts. These, elect these uh, low energy electron uh, particles, ions, are then forged into the machine, the, into the accelerator, where they go through electric field and gain energy. Now as they are moving through the accelerator, and gaining energy, we put a small amount of gas in the accelerator. Now that gas interact with the ions and due to the charge exchange process, they pick up electron and lose electron and so on and they attain positive charge. So the positive charge ions are then propelled out of the accelerator and those ions are then used to do various type of research. I don't know if you guys can see the cursor, I try to point out there are these uh, units which are light yellow in color. Now these units are magnets and they typically use the basic physics law or you can say the right hand thumb rule to guide the positive charge moving ion. So a positive charge particle into a certain direction, you know, based on where you where we want it to be, whether we want the particle to be on the left or the right side of the beam line. You know, and so we, we use those uh, basic physics concepts to guide the particle in the beam path. So let me start with ion matter interaction. Now, in basic ion matter interaction, there's a lot of things going on. So the figure here shows you a very rudimentary form of an ion interaction with matter. So from the right hand side, you would see a dashed line and over the dashed line, you see a, a, a blue fat arrow that shows you the direction of the incident ion beam. Now the, the incident ion beam is targeted onto a target. Usually an incident ion beam is also known as projectile. So a projectile hits the target and when the projectile hits the target, there are many possibilities. So one of those is that the projectile might lose its energy with the nucleus of the target, the nucleus of the atoms of the in, in the target. And that's known as nuclear energy loss. Now when that happens, it might result in three different possibilities. One could be that it would give so much energy to the target atom that that particle, that those atoms are then sputtered. 
out or ejected out. Now that's known as sputtered particle. There could be that possibility that there would be a backscatter particle. That is that the target uh, incident ion beam of the projectile hits the target and is backscattered. Just like when you play billiards. You try to shoot a ping pong ball onto a target, you know, a solid ball. And what would happen is the ping pong ball will bounce back. So it's exactly like that. That would be a backscatter particle. And then there are recoils, which are basically uh, target atoms with very low energy uh, or with very high energy and high momentum that are recoiled. Another way that the projectile can lose energy is by electronic energy loss. That means that the, the incident ion beam traveling at few uh, thousands to MeV energy range interact with the electrons in the target, you know, in the uh, electrons in the atoms of the target. Now, when that happens, again, the in interacting ion beam slows down and the electrons are ejected or there could be a possibility that the photon is ejected or there is a possibility that the X-rays are ejected. So these are the processes that can, is governed by the electronic energy loss. There is another process where the target is thin enough and when the target is thin enough, the incident ion beam would just transmit through the target. That means it will penetrate the target and actually come out from the other end of the target. Now when that happens, the incident ion beam will lose its energy and scientists and researchers use the concept of the how much energy is lost to determine what type of, type of target there is or what type of atoms are there in the target. So let me start with sputtered particle or the process which is known as sputtering. Now sputtering experimental challenges when one is performing measurements that has to do with sputtering. So the first and the foremost thing is that we have to perform experiments in ultra high vacuum. And for that, we use various vacuum pumps. And another thing is that when you're trying to measure the angular distribution of sputtered atoms, you have to worry about how are you gonna set up the geometry. So in this figure here, what you see is, I have labeled these uh, important uh, parts of this equipment here that is in the vacuum chamber in one of the labs uh, at the University of North Texas. So the label A is basically electrostatic lens which use electric field. So you can think of it as uh, just like in as a, as a simple optics where you have a ray of light that is going through a lens and focusing onto a certain point. The similar uh, concept happens in ion optics where you have an ion beam going through a particular lens, but in this case, the lens cannot be physical. It has to be magnetic or electrostatic. So we have, in this case, we have used electrostatic lens. So electrostatic lens will focus the, uh, focus the ions onto a certain point. In this case, the point is where the target is held. So that is uh, what you see this manipulator, target manipulator C, and the target is at uh, B, the label B. The, uh, as half, the spheric, uh, Semisphere cylindrical structure that you see in front of the target is actually a catcher. It's an aluminum foil held on to a very high purity aluminum uh, surface, which will catch sputtered particles, the particles that are ejected. So the particles that's going to come out is going to go around everywhere in the chamber, but some of them will fall on to, and it's a isotropic process. That meaning that the particles that travel in every direction with the same intensity. So in this case, the particle that travels onto the aluminum foil uh, will be caught because of the high vacuum conditions and the high sticking probability of the particles onto a very high purity aluminum foil. The figure on the right hand side shows you the schematic of the sputtering geometry. So here it is, we have the collector foil, uh, like a semi uh, cylindrical surface with a small hole in between for the passage of the incident ion beam so basically what we had to do was we had to make this aluminum, a high purity aluminum holder. And on that aluminum holder, we, we put an aluminum foil, a high purity aluminum foil with a hole in between so that we can allow the ion beam to pass through. As the ion beam passes through with the red line, you can see that it hits onto a target. In this case, for this presentation, now I have used various targets, but for this presentation, I'm concentrating on the bismuth target, that is solid bismuth, the heaviest uh, stable metal on the periodic table. 
So as you can see, the sputtered particles off from the bismuth target will fall onto the aluminum foil in every direction. What I'm interested in is only that they fall onto the aluminum foil that is placed in front of the target. Uh, the angle theta will describe the polar angle in front of the, uh, the, the sputtering geometry. The target, of course, needs to have some kind of a bias because what happens is, as you saw in the previous slide, as the ion beam hits the target, it's going to emit electrons. It's going to eject electrons on the target. Now, electrons carry negative charge. Now, when this negative charge, they travel away from the target, they uh, destroy the charge collection process. I need to know how much particles, how many positive ion particles I have actually bombarded onto the target. I need to know that information. And to know that information, I have to make sure that no electron will ever eject the target. And for that, we put, we simply solve it by putting a bias onto a target with a DC battery. And then that is connected to a current integrator, which actually counts how many ions are coming or uh, hitting the target. So after that process is done, we take the aluminum foil out for analysis and we install it in another chamber in the ion beam modification analysis lab at the University of North Texas. The figure here shows you the schematic of the lab. The big cylinder that you guys see are the centerpiece with two accelerators. The blue one is a double-ended system or is a tandem accelerator, meaning that it will need an ion source. So the, uh, the, the particle that needs to be produced are outside the accelerator. The one that's tan will have an ion source inside the accelerator and that's a single-ended pelletron, a single-ended accelerator. So for this experiment, I used a double-ended accelerator because I wanted to use a particle such as silicon or oxygen. So once I have produced those particles like silicon or oxygen, I pass them through using an ion source. I pass them through the peloton accelerator through these beam lines. Now I also wanted to make uh, wanted to point you out that whatever beam lines, the beam the lines that you see on the screen here, all of the beam lines are under high vacuum so that the ions do not lose energy to any particles in their path, and they save all the because it it get it, we invest a lot of money in giving these ion all this energy. So it would not be a good idea to not keep them in vacuum so that they lose energy. We don't want them to lose energy to air. We want them to lose energy to a diff, uh, something that we really want to. For this purpose, what I used was a multipurpose chamber in the ion beam modification analysis lab at the University of North Texas uh, that is being labeled out for you guys here. Now this multipurpose chamber was used for analyzing sputtered particle. The figure here shows you the uh, image or the picture of the multipurpose chamber. The analysis technique that I use for this is Rutherford backscattering spectrometry. It's a high sensitive, a highly sensitive ion beam based surface analytical technique. It tells you what kind of material is there on a target surface what kind of atom is there and how many is there to a very high resolution. So the idea is pretty simple. You have a, a particle that comes in from, uh, if you are focusing on a certain, uh, on the figure on the screen, you would see a structure on the right hand corner. And in that structure, you see a hole. So in that hole, through that hole, you have a high energy particle traveling through that structure and entering another hole and hitting the aluminum foil that I had taken out from the previous chamber. It hits that aluminum foil and the particles are backscattered. So if you can recollect from the previous screen, I'm now interested in the backscattered particles and that's why it's known as backscattering spectrometry based on the Rutherford idea. So those backscattered particles are detected by the detector which is labeled as C. Different elements in, this, in the figure here are used for different purposes like for 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 uh, for the aluminum mesh labeled as A is used to suppress any electrons leaving the target. Again, the idea is the same. We want to know how many particles are hitting this aluminum foil to do the analysis. So that's why we don't want to lose charge and that's why we want to keep electrons in the target. 
B does the same thing. It does not allow electron to remove from the top. B is the same thing, but it is not for the target, but it's for the ion beam. Now, when the ion beam travels through a beam pipe, it might hit something. And when the ion beam interacts with matter, again, it picks up electrons. Now, those electrons, again, destroy the calibration. And, th and that's why we use this kind of uh, setup to suppress those electrons. The figure here shows you a much detailed setup uh, of the RBS used. In this case, you see an incident ion beam, electron trap, which will, which will suppress any electrons carried by the ion beam. You see a target holder, which can be moved up and down. You want the target holder to move up and down because you have an aluminum foil. And in that aluminum foil, uh, you have the particles that are being sputtered. You have caught that particle that have been sputtered. They stick to this aluminum foil. I want, now want to know how many of them are there. And then you see this blue line, which is the backscattered particles, which is then collected by the solid state detector. The solid state detector goes on to the pre-amplifier for the fine tuning of the, or shaping of the pulses. Then it goes, goes to the amplifier for the amplification. And then it goes to the multi-channel analyzer because I want to bin those particles that I have collected uh, in, 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 depending on their energy. So what are the results? So the idea is that first thing that comes to mind is visual. What happens when you sputter for enormous amount of time? So let's say if you sputter for like 12 hours, the result is in front of you guys. It's a scanning electron microscope image. The one on the left is before sputtering for a bismuth target. It's a smooth surface. The one on the right is one after sputtering with 50 kilo electron volt, uh, electron volt argon beam, argon particle. But this was not my goal for the experiment, measuring surface deformation. Again, it gives you a good idea, it gives you a good image. It helps you reassuring the beam spot size. I would know that my beam spot size of sputtering was around 200 micrometers. Uh, so I focused it down to 200 micrometers spot size, the particle. And if there were any previous deformations as compared to one in the uh, after sputtering. What I am interested in is how many particles are collected at different spots on the aluminum foil. So the figure here shows you a strip, uh, a rectangular strip, and that's the aluminum foil. You can see with the hole, particles on either side of the aluminum foil will have about similar amount, uh, there would be a similar amount of sputtered particles. The four spectra that I show you guys here are known as the Rutherford backscattering spectrometry spectra. Uh, you see this, as a Gaussian surf, as a Gaussian peak. Now that's because it's talk, it is being, it, it's because of the particle sputter, that is the bismuth. So that peak is the bismuth peak. The spectra uh, is counts, which is the energy. So basically the, the, uh, on the X axis, you see the backscattered energy uh, range. Now the spectrum has been taken at several points. Uh, roughly at about 20 to 25 points along the aluminum foil because I want to know the angular distribution as well. Once I have those points, I uh, use a fit. So I uh, did some calculations and use the uh, backscattering uh, equation to find out how many, uh, uh, how much particles were sputtered. And to do that, I had to come up with a fit. Now this comes on, this equation comes in from the idea from uh, Sigmund's linear collision cascade theory that the particles will be sputtered in, as a cosine distribution. No, but that's a theory and that's a very rudimentary theory. What I found out when the particle do not sputter with a cosine distribution, but it's sort of an over cosine distribution, right? So basically it's, uh, it won't form like a very, uh, like a cosine curve, but at towards the center the, the, of the distribution, it will be, it will have a sharp uh, peak. Now that's because of the uh, over cosine distribution. And as you can see it in the results here. So the dot represents, uh, the symbols in the graph here represent the experimental points and the line represents the, uh, the fit using that equation. And A and B are just some uh, fitting parameters. Different lines or different uh, colors uh, or symbol denotes here particles sputtered with different energy. So the target was bismuth and they were sputtered with different energy varying from 10 kilo electron volt to 50 kilo electron volt. Now once I did that, 
what I did was I integrated that fitted function over a two pi steradian solid angle in front of the target surface. And that was a simple integration which ended up giving me the overall sputtering yield. And that's the equation I got for the sputtering yield. And once I used my parameters A and B from the fit, I found the sputtering yield for bismuth, which I used as five circular dots. In this figure here, I show you guys. Now, of course, when you do an experiment, you want to compare it to theory. So what I did was I compared it to Sigmund's theory and using a surface binding energy formula published by another author. And that's given by a dashed line. Now, theory can use, now for experiment, I only use five different energy range for the projectile. But for theory, we went from one, elect, one uh, kilo electron volt to about 100 kilo electron volt. And that's why I see a smooth line or a dotted line here for theoretical work. I also compared it to an empirical formula that is used to find the sputtering yield. Now, the empirical formula is basically just a modification of theoretical formula, but it uses the experimental results over the period of decades. So people keep doing experiments, and some uh, researchers modify the theoretical uh, or the equations and use, by using the experimental results, and that's what is known as the empirical formula. So there were some good results when we match or when we compare the empirical formula. But of course, not very close, because again, in an experiment, it would give you uh, results which are true in nature uh, for a given ion solid uh, or ion target combination. And I also did simulation, pure simulation, which is known as SHRIM. It's a stopping range of ion in matter. It's a very famous simulation. Uh, it's a very good simulation uh, that could be downloaded by anybody. Uh, it's free of charge. And if anybody is interested in understanding the basics of ion matter interaction, this would be a good starting point. It gives you a wide range of experiment or simulation experiments that you guys can do. People actually publish, uh, do research using this simulation and publish results. Uh, I use the simulation, and I am an experimentalist by nature, so I use the simulation to compare my experimental results. I do not rely on simulation alone, but it's a very good point if anybody of you is interested in ion matter interaction. All right. I would now like to move your uh, focus to material analysis at Louisiana Accelerator Center. And as mentioned earlier in the talk, or before my talk, uh, to be precise, researchers have been using the accelerators lately for using material analysis, for imaging, for creating 3D maps to solve various problems, current problems. And that's the area of research, my current area of research. So the figure here shows you the setup of my current lab. There are four beam lines starting, I would start with the left. The beam line on the left that you see is labeled as student beam line. Now we try to call it a student beam line because it's heavily used by students. Uh, they use it for learning purposes. It does pretty much almost everything that the other beam lines do in a macroscopic scale. Then, then we have an implantation beam line. The implantation beam line is what we use for uh, bombarding particles onto a target, the, similar to what I have shown you guys uh, earlier on, the previous part of this lecture. So in that, we bombard particles onto a target and we modify a target. The result for those is just like producing devices, new devices that we use in our smartphones that we use in new device technology and so on and so forth. The third one is the BSL-2 beam line. BSL stands for biosafety level. So you have a biosafety level 2 beam line, and I'll talk about that uh, in a later part of the talk. Uh, it is used to do space research or space radiation simulation research. And then the final beam line that I want to show you guys, and that's the topic of this part of the talk, is the microprobe beam line that we use for material analysis, heavily for material analysis. So this is our microprobe beamline end station. Uh, there is too much into it. On the right hand side, you see a electronic which has 
different MCAs, detector uh, controllers, power supplies, scan amplifiers, and so on and so forth. Um, the physical equipment is on the left hand side, as a, or roughly at the center, you can see, labeled as the, there's a mass spectrometer. This is currently in uh, production. We are working on it. Uh, it's uh, not in use right now because we are developing it. It's an ongoing project. We have an analysis chamber where we do the analysis where we analyze various materials. We have magnetic lenses here because now we are dealing with not kilo electron volt ions, but we are dealing with million electron volt ions at LAC. So for that, we don't need one or two lenses, but we need three lenses and each of these lenses are basically a quadruplet lenses. So these are magnetic lenses and they're kept in series and each of these lenses have four magnetic, uh, four lenses in them. So they make a quadruplet triplet. Uh, it's a patented uh, discovery done by Oxford Microbeam. You guys can find it out. Uh, if you just Google Oxford Microbeam, you would know all the details about, the le about these lenses and how these lenses focus pa ion particle. Uh, that's not my area of research. I use it. I know how it does, but how better it would focus the lens is not my area of research, but it's completely totally different area of research. People in uh, universities like Singapore have dedicated their life in finding how small we can focus an MEV ion beam so that we can actually go down to find nanoparticle, pick up nanoparticle by itself. Uh, nevertheless, I move on to what I do. Uh, that is the analysis of the material. So what are the tools that we have in hand? Well, we have one to three million electron volt protons. We use protons heavily, easier to produce, small lightest element in the periodic table, uh, doesn't damage the material as much while you're analyzing. So it's basically a non-destructive technique. Uh, we use Oxford microbeam lens to focus the MeV ions, protons, to a spot size of one micrometer by a one micrometer. So you can think about it like about 10 of a dimension of a uh, average human hair. Now that's a bad reference because the thickness of the human hair might differ, but you can assume that it to be about a 10 micrometer thickness. So a beam spot is focused down to one micrometer by one micrometer, uh, a square beam. Then we have a scanning system in hand so that we can move this ion beam over as we want into a line scan, into a square scan, into a raster scan, you call it. And then we have a high vacuum analysis chamber. Again, you want all of this to happen in high vacuum because you don't want your ions to lose energy to anything else but the target. What do we do with all this? Well, we do the Rutherford backscattering, but now we do it with a micro beam. And that's why it's called a micro probe. Then we have a, when we do particle induced X-ray emission, and this is what I'm, I'm gonna talk about in this uh, talk, uh, in this uh, presentation here. So we basically bombard protons onto a target. And by doing so, we produce X-rays. And the technique is called particle induced X-ray emission or commonly known as PIXE, the acronym, P-I-X-E. We can also use, if there are, if the target is uh, thin enough, the ions will transmit through the target and then we can pick up those targets and use and do the ion, scanning transmission ion microscopy. This is similar to TEM, the transmission electron microscopy. But think about it, an electron will lose energy onto a surface with a target. But an ion beam will not do that. It can travel deeper into the target because it's uh, and to a very localized spot because of its heavy mass and high energy. And then we have the secondary electron microscopy. Don't com com confuse it with the scanning electron microscopy. This is secondary electron microscopy where we pick up secondary electrons that are ejected when you fit an ion beam. Similar to scanning electron microscopy, but not the same. So let's talk about micropixy imaging. Uh, this figure here depicts the uh, schematic of what we have at LAC or what I showed you guys earlier on the picture. So we have an aperture which will define the object size. So it's similar to the basic optics you can think of. You have an aperture that defines the object size. Then you have the lens. You can think of an optical lens. In this case, we are not using uh, uh, photons or uh, ray of light, but we are using ion beam and that's why we have to use magnetic or electrostatic lenses. So we use magnetic lenses here, three of them to form a uh, 
focused image. Now those will form a very focused Im uh, image of an ion beam onto a sample. Now when we do that, we have a scan coil and those scan coil is basically just an electrostatic uh, potential changing its direction all the time. So in this case, uh, back and moving positive and negative back and forth, so electric field moving up and down. So it moves the target, it moves the sample uh, or the ion beam onto the sample. There are two ways of doing it. You either move the sample and have a fixed beam or you either move the beam and have a fixed sample. So as it turns out, over the period of years, people find out that it's uh, easier and much more robust to move the ion beam as opposed to move the sample because that would actually might change the sample or it'll, uh, the sample might not be solid all the time. So it's not very feasible. Once we ion beam hits the sample, it produces x-rays and those x-rays are picked up by an x-ray spectrometer or a detector the spectrometer because it has all the electronics and with that we produce a map an x-ray map uh, 2d map now if we turn the sample around we can actually produce a 3d map but in this case we produce just for a surface we produce a 2d map uh, and then we analyze those map and find out how many uh, particles are there or what type of particles are there on a certain surface so this is basically the essence of particle induced x-ray emission producing elemental maps now don't think of it as a map that is being produced or, or the image that you see it's a very expensive image because that image what you see is for element it's not for uh, all the element but for a very specific element so you can see that uh, let's say for in this particular instance you would know that uh, where the calcium is in a given sample and how localized it is because the color coding will denote you the intensity of those elements. So this is how the figure on the left hand side shows you a spectra and that spectrum is a typical pixie spectrum. The green lines are actually the, the raw data that a, a spectrometer will give you. The red lines are the fitted spectrum and we fitted it using uh, a software known as GeoPixie. It's a software developed by uh, uh, an Australian uh, researcher uh, in Melbourne. It's a very sophisticated software. We use it for fitting our pixie spectrum. And we analyze that pixie spectrum to find out uh, how much material is there and what material is there. The idea is the x-rays that are emitted off of the material are actually very specific uh, because of if you use the idea of shell theory, you have K-shell, L-shell, M-shell. So a specific electron is being ejected by a moving particle. Now when an electron is ejected, let's say a K-shell electron is ejected or an L-shell electron is ejected, for a higher shell electron to jump onto that lower shell will need a very specific energy. And in doing so, when it drops onto a lower shell, it will emit that X-ray, uh, it would emit that X-ray. And that X-ray will have a very specific energy and that energy is picked up by, that X-ray has been picked up by the X-ray spectrometer. And that's what, what you see as a result here. Uh, we, we use this spectra to create maps. In this case, you see an application of a, basically a desulfurization of a natural gas was the project. So we collaborated with uh, chemical engineers in a university uh, here in US and they wanted to know uh, some details about the catalyst scavenger, uh, which is used for the desulfurization in the natural gas in their uh, plant. Unfortunately, we were not able to publish this result yet because of uh, the proprietary issue. Uh, that's what you deal, uh, have to deal with when you work with companies uh, and that collaborate with, the, uh, with certain universities. Nevertheless, they allow us to present it in some meetings. But, and here are the results you see so the desulfurization of this, you see the deficiency of sulfur in the grains that have been obtained from, from, from this map. So you only see calcium and you see iron. The sulfur peak that you see here is obtained from a different part in the region that is not shown here. The frame size here is 1.5 milli, millimeter by 1.5 meter. So you can see what we do, we scan a micrometer beam over a sample by a 1.5 millimeter, millimeter to a 1.5 millimeter square. We can actually do it whichever way we want. We can do a line scan, we can do a rectangular scan and so on. We analyze various type of materials. 
uh, people have come on with come up with unbelievable materials to for us to to uh, characterize with and as uh, a multidisciplinary scientist and as an iron beam physicist i am interested to see how i could use all this in various field you know in various sciences uh one of the projects that i had owned taken in last year was uh with a local farm in louisiana i am from uh, I, i work in a university in louisiana and it's a certain southeastern state heavily rich in, it's a big farming land lot of green uh as it turns out alligator uh farming is a million dollar industry in this part of us however the problem is that the eggs obtained from the farms are not fertile or not fertile enough when you compare the eggs that you obtain from wild there are various factors that could cause this problem and there's a lot of biology a lot of chemistry that goes around to cause this problem but the idea is the basis is that farmers and unfortunately uh government in louisiana is losing a lot of money because each egg would cost them an alligator which is possibly about 3 to 4000 dollars and they're losing about 80% of the egg so they are interested in what's going on at the elemental level uh and they sort of found us and they said okay we want to find what's going on in our egg shell in the elemental level because as it turns out the egg shell uh makes the crucial part of uh control a very crucial part of a healthy being of an egg uh, which turns out to be whether a egg is going to be fertile or an infertile egg so uh, figure on the left hand side the bottom left hand side would show you the image of an alligator typical alligator egg with the bar scale the one on the top left hand side will show you the map of the louisiana and an alligator nest uh, from where the farmers obtain these eggs and the figure on the right will show you a collage of a micro pixie scan images elemental images so we scan for several elements what i show you guys is calcium chlorine and sulfur on various part of the action now the action have different regions it has an outer shell it has an inner shell it has a memory it, it has a central layer it has a honeycomb layer uh so different layer have different features and the elemental composition changes drastically from one layer to another uh and we are in collaboration with these farmer with the with the uh environmentalist scientists that uh, study environment and uh, farming and see what's going on at the elemental level in these eggs that could say to tell something about farmers to change their feed to change what the alligators eat so that they produce much better eggs and fertile eggs so that they don't lose as much energy so basic idea of doing research here for me is to do research or for anybody in this lab is to do research with a purpose so whatever we do has a certain purpose to it uh i might be running against time here but the last part of the talk i want to go over is radiation uh and solar radiation uh and the research that we use uh or the labs that we use here to do solar uh, research with space or nasa so radiation can be categorized into uh, radiation can be of different forms as you guys know it the electromagnetic radiation that we use for communication there is particle radiation which we try to stay away from that is acoustic radiation and then there is gravitational radiation applications of radiation are enormous uh, in us here we use a americium 241 source in a source detector or at least we used to for quite some time those were radioactive but very sensitive for radiation uh, very sensitive to detect smoke radiation <clears throat> we still use x rays uh, which is a common form of radiation in medicine the application is enormous uh, as you all know is medical professionals uh, use it or doctors use it to detect patient injuries or any kind of malignancies that they want to detect engineers use uh, radiographic cameras to inspect wells or defects uh after construction and lately we have been using radiation for food irradiation to sanitize food to kill bacteria in food
And of course, let me answer the link here. And of course, the effect of intense gamma radiation is uh, not hidden from you guys, uh, at least thanks to Marvel movies. As you see uh, Dr. Bruce Banner undergoing intense gamma radiation and turning into uh, the so-called Mighty Hulk. Uh, and you never know, it might happen. Uh, so, Radiation can be categorized in two categories. General categories, you can say you have ionizing radiation that you want to stay away from because they are damaging to the basic of our atoms, that is the nucleus. And then you have non-ionizing radiation like light, infrared, microwave, and so on. We use that. Uh, they are damaging, but not as much. Uh, not over the lifetime of the human unless we use it to a very high intensity. But the ionizing radiation you want to stay away from. And the way you're going to stay away from ionizing radiation is by looking for this sign. This is an international symbol for radiation and uh, there are unsafe for humans without shielding. So unless you have proper shielding, you should stay away from such radiation zone. All right. So you might have heard of solar exploration and uh, colonization of moon and Mars in the near future which uh, sounded like a science, science fiction in 70s and 80s or 90s, but it is no more a fiction anymore. Uh, NASA, US, and other space agencies in the world are actually looking for colonization of uh, planetary bodies like Moon or Mars in near future. And then I say near future is four years down the line for Moon and about uh, 15 to 20 years down the line for Mars. Uh, but the problem is that they don't, don't, they don't have geomagnetic shielding of Earth. We enjoy geomagnetic shielding of Earth, uh, where it deflects the energetic ions, that the kind that you produce in the lab, we deflect those, the Earth deflects that uh, naturally for us, so that it won't penetrate the atmosphere and we can live and prosper, life can live and prosper on Earth. So this is uh, the intensified image of the sun uh, shooting solar particle radiation towards Earth and other planetary objects around it. This is what would happen if the geomagnetic fielding field would vanish. And this is what would happen overnight to Earth. We would be deprived of life like Mars. Now we want to explore Moon and Mars. So what do we do about it? Well, here we are on Earth. The International Space Station, where we can send objects too, we can take objects, bring objects from there pretty easily. SpaceX, as you must have seen in the news, recently launched uh, an uh, instrument and sent something of uh, astronaut, uh, US-based astronaut over onto the International Space Station uh, in a long time. And this was the first time for a private company to do that. This is where we want to be in four years. We want to uh, colonize, start colonizing moon. And this is where we want to be in the next 20 years to colonize Mars. But again, we are going to take baby steps. This is finally what we envision or NASA envisions for uh, humans on, our, uh, on Mars. We want to envision a colony. Uh, the colony that would be under tunnel. The work will begin uh, digging in tunnels in Mars. Do, uh, doing habitat, producing habitat that where astronauts can prosper with and without space suits inside the tunnel and outside the space tunnel with the space suits, of course. How do the radiation lab, small lab like ours, come into picture? Well, we use ion beam, which are replicas of ion particles present in space. So there are ion particles, uh, mostly 90% of particles in, in, in a solar system is energetic proton. And those energetic protons can damage uh, human organ, can damage plants, can damage any other instrument that we carry unless we are shielded. What we do here is we produce those particles in vacuum and we bring them up to air in a safe biosafety glove box. So the figure here shows you the glove box where we bring the particle in air. They travel about uh, five, 10 centimeters in air 
for the picture you see in the figure here, you would see that there is a beam pipe that brings the particle into air. There is a window and the window is about 200 nanometer thick silicon nitride window that allows the particle to travel into the air from vacuum with the minimal loss of energy. Uh, again, uh, we keep on publishing our work that we develop and the work from this was developed uh, was a project of a student which was held by me and other scientists in the lab and it was published in the uh, nuclear instruments and measurements paper. Uh, what the idea is pretty simple. We want to use these facility to irradiate plants, to shoot particles on plants, to shoot particles on animal and human tissue, to see how these, these tissues and, and uh, plants and human tissues will react to radiation. So we use the same magnetic lenses in another beam line. Well, similar type of lenses. I mean, not the same one, but the, another lens set of lenses that we bought. We focus them into the chamber in this, in, in this particular chamber that you see on the left hand side. And then we defocus it, we allow it to expand. So this is the schematic of the expansion of, the, of that uh, space radiation simulation facility. The blue here shows you the ion beam, the particles are, are traveling in vacuum. And as they travel in vacuum, uh, they pass through the lenses, the lenses focus them onto a certain target in the chamber. And that target in the chamber uh, allows the defocusing of the ion beam so we allow the ion to travel further. As we allow the ion to travel further, we put a window in front of the beam, and then we bring the beam out to air. And then once the beam is in air, we put tissue in, in, in front of the beam, and then we analyze those tissue using the various techniques. So what have we done so far? Well, we have irradiated plant seeds, plant seedlings. We expose roots, tips, you, leaves, you call it. We measure their growth after radiation. What we find out was that it, ex that it changes the response of the plant towards gravity enormously. As we all know, the plant responds to gravity uh, and they need gravity to grow. And they also respond to microgravity in space in the International Space Station. So when we have exposed these plants to ion beams, they lose the sense of gravity. This is very important for developing or growing plants in International Space Station and for growing plants in space because plants are going to be food that the astronauts and future human uh, colonies are going to eat in space. The ongoing project deals with aspiring tissues from rhesus macaque. Uh, it's a non-human primate, uh, origin from uh, a monkey from, uh, that originated from India. And uh, we aspire tissue, we have a, we have a non-human primate colony here uh, in the university where we hold about 7,000 to 8,000 non-human primates and we do various experiments on them uh, as humanely as possible. Uh, and we radiate the tissue that's fired from monkey and we work on culturing and understanding how this tissue responds due to radiation. And last, I want to show you guys the maintenance images of the accelerator lab. And you see how a lab like this, and we have a lab where we open the accelerator. And in this accelerator, you can see a student working into a beam line, uh, working with the accelerator, cleaning it. That's, his, that's the student's yearly job, or at least in the two year, we try to open it, we try to clean all the bits and pieces, uh, put the accelerator back together and uh, make it like a brand new or sort of brand new project. So the accelerator that we use here is about 20 years old and we hope that it keeps running for the next 20 years because these are the machines that are basically uh, don't have any end date on their life but if, they, if we keep maintaining them, if we keep cleaning them and using them properly then they will run for as long as we want. And with that, I would like to thank you all for your presentation, for your patience with all the technical difficulties. Uh, and I would now respond to any questions or answers that you guys have or have been uh, using that chat.
All right, Milin. Milin, sir, I'm ready for a Q and A. Sir, if uh, any any student or uh, to take admission hey, for hello hello. Milen. What are the different research areas? Hello, Naresh. Yes, Milen. Uh, what is the procedure to take admission for PED in your institute? Uh, well, partly from the from my experience, I remember that a student would have to have an international student would have to have uh, taken a that the GRE examination. Hello, hello, Akshay, Akshay, please mute all. Hello. Yes. So, Milan. Uh, first, the student need to find out uh, if they want to do research, if they want to do PhD, they want to they want to find out whether what's the area of research you know they are interested in. Once they have discovered the area of research that they are interested in, once they have found out sort of the range of professors they have interested in, then they can look for the criteria. Uh, the basic idea that's needed is that you need to have a GRE exam and you need to have an English language exam. Again, considering that in India is not an English speaking company, country, but these two are not very difficult. I mean, students from uh, a college like yours should be able to pass it in any given day. They just need a few weeks of practice. So they should be more than capable of passing these exams. They should not fear of taking these exams at any given point. Uh, another thing is to be in contact with the faculty who you want to want to do research with. Uh, ask them what they can offer and so on and so forth because it's a very huge undertaking. Uh, doing PhD as you know is a life changing moment. You know it's a life defining experience. Uh, so and especially when you do it in a, uh, in a US universities in a country uh, outside India, uh, you want to be very cautious of what exactly are you getting into. So I would say start taking those, work on taking those exam, contact the department, uh, and look for the areas of research. There is a question that says, there is a question that says, what is the cost of RBS? Okay, so I would answer that in two parts. Cost of developing RBS is huge. It could be as close to as million dollars, about nine hundred thousand to a million dollar. But cost of doing RBS is not that great. Now, if you want to do RBS, there are two pathways. One is whether your project is good enough so that labs like ours think that we can publish a result out of it. When we do that, it's free of charge. There is no charge for it. But if you don't want to do that, if you don't want to publish, you just want to keep it to yourself, then you, you would have to pay about $150 to $200 per hour to do RBS. I hope that answered this question. I have one question that says application of ion beam accelerator in vaccine and drug. Okay, so uh, there is, yes, there is application now to develop the drug directly. Uh, there has been no such application of the direct development as you can say that iron beam has used for uh, you know we use iron beam directly to develop drug but yes we have used it we have worked with rajesh 
we have worked with other scientists to develop these drugs. And let me uh, I will send a link. Uh, I will send a link to this chat box uh, as soon as I can with a recent paper that we use to image, to produce a scan images, elemental images of uh, SIV infected monkeys. Now, SIV is a in, uh, immunodeficiency. It's like HIV for humans. So HIV is a human immune deficiency and SIV is simian. So it's basically the same disease, but for monkeys. Now, as you know that HIV, monkeys don't get HIV, but they do get SIV. So what we do here in NIRC, we have monkeys with the SIV infection. We take out the tissue of those monkeys and, uh, and it from different universities. And we, come, and we analyze those using uh, RBS and Pixie and we try to find out elementary compositions. We try to find out what's going on for the monkeys that have received the vaccine and the monkeys that have not received the vaccine or received a certain vaccine. In that way, we sort of guide the vaccine research. I hope that answers that question. I'll try to share uh, the paper. What is the fee structure to apply for PhD abroad and are there any scholarship for the same? All right, so uh, there's a question from uh, Jessica. Uh, and it's about the fee structure for PhD abroad. Now, I don't necessarily know what how much it costs to take a GRE and uh, English language exam. Uh, however, uh, and for applications for every university, now there is an application fee, yes, and if you, it's few tens of dollars, could run up to hundred dollars, let's say. However, uh, When you enter for a PhD program in US, you enter with a scholarship. If you do not have a scholarship granted to you, you work as a teaching assistant or a research assistant. So there is a scholarship for you that is granted to you for a PhD, where you just do your research. And you perform research with a certain professor, and that's the best. Another one is that you enter a PhD without a scholarship, but then you are given a teaching assistantship where you teach undergraduate labs. So when you teach undergraduate labs or you do some kind of work for the department, they pay you, uh, which is enough, which was I was given. I was given, I didn't have any scholarship when I entered. So I was given the teaching assistantship. I got the scholarship a year later because I kept applying for it, uh, but that did not uh, kept me from getting into a US university. Uh, so applying, I've. A broad fee structure, it's, it's kind of a vague question because I don't know how much uh, would be more or less for a certain individual, but I would say that it's doable for anyone. So yes, there are scholarships and there is a fee structure in place. Then there's a question which says, what is the OMILAC mass spectrometer? That's a very good question. Now an OMILAC stands for organic molecular imaging at LAC. Using ion beams, nobody can do molecular imaging. It's very difficult. People have, uh, people are trying to do that. We do elemental imaging because what happens is when you shoot an ion beam onto a target, it interacts with the nucleus, it interacts with the electron. It is not, the, not necessarily with just the whole molecule, a bunch of atoms per se. What we do here at LAC is we have developed, developed an organic molecular imaging technique where we would shoot an ion beam and we would extract the material from the target. Now when we extract the material from the target, we use those extracted materials. We make them go through a spectrometer and that's the mass spectrometer. We, we, we use the time of flight technique. We study the time taken by a certain molecule to fly through a defined region and depending on the time taken by a certain molecule, we will be defining how much, what is the mass of that molecule. And that's why it's called a mass spectrometer. Milan, I don't know if I have missed any more questions. Uh, let's see.
is there an upper age criteria to perform uh, US universities in US? There is no age criteria for universities research in US. Uh, you can pursue university PhD uh, in US universities whenever or however however you want. And then there's a question which says, where goes the electron after the fusion of the particles? Oh, so the electrons, once the ion beam, when you are doing the analysis, once the ion beam hits the target, the electrons are scattered everywhere in the chamber. Unless you put a bias on the electron, unless you put the bias on the electron, then they are suppressed, then they stay in the target. But once, once the electrons that come out of the target, they go everywhere in the chamber. Uh, the electrons that are pushed onto the target, that is connected, uh, that electron uh, passes through a wire that is connected to a charge integrator. So that goes to the tar charge integrator which collects how many electrons are produced or how many charges is produced and then the charge integrator is connected to the ground. So that's how the process of electron goes. There are two types, one that goes into the target and the one that is being coming out of the target. Hello, uh, please check. Uh, uh, okay, I have a question. I will send you, Naresh, and then we yeah. will email to our uh, participant. Okay, uh, yes, if there yes. is no question, then uh, uh, thank you, thank you so much, uh, Naresh. Uh, I am sincere, uh, sincere thanks towards our SSNC board, our uh, respected uh, principal, Dr. Neha Jaktani, ma'am, our uh, respected HOD, uh, Professor Namrata Ajwani, ma'am, uh, Vice Principal uh, Dinesh, sir. Uh, then uh, Sima Madam, Steffi Madam, Lakshman Sir, Kunam Madam, and all our uh, teaching, non-teaching staff, uh, physics department. And also, I am very thankful to our uh, faculty members and my dear students uh, for attending this uh, informative lecture. I personally like all the flow of lectures, uh, different um, applications of all sciences uh, like physics, chemistry, mathematical different types of equations, then how uh, different types of simulation techniques. And uh, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, uh, thank you, William, and thank you, everyone. Uh, and also, I am also thankful our technical uh, team, uh, Professor uh, uh, Akshay Nimkar, then Akbar Khan, uh, Professor Kartiki Ma'am from uh, Don Bosco Department, and uh, also sincere thanks towards uh, Dr. Vinod Gopal. Uh, uh, yes. I found, oh, I have said it. Yes. Is there any question you can answer? Yes, I found, a, no, I was just replying to, uh, there was a question about application of ion beam, you know, accelerators in uh, vaccine research and so on. So I sent the link. Oh, uh, yes. And uh, if the access to that paper is limited, there is one more thing I would like to point out uh, to uh, researchers and students specifically, that whenever you find a paper online and if you don't have access to it, please don't stop your work over there. Contact the author, email the author, use whatever means you can. There are always an email, there is always a corresponding author email and the author would always love to share that paper with you. You know, not the actual paper that has been published, but the version of the paper that has been published before. Million would know this, a lot of faculty would know this, but I would like to point that out to students. Uh, a lot of students, even in here in US, uh, do not take that path. I still do that because I don't have access to a lot of paper, my papers myself. So please try and contact because when you read paper, you get the idea that what others have done and what you don't have to do. What mistakes they have made, what they have done already. And with that, I thank everyone, including students. I thank, you the, thank the staff. I thank you, Milin personally for allowing me to give this presentation. It was not a very detailed presentation given the breadth of the topic, but if you want, somewhere down the line, maybe I don't know, near next few years, I can give you consolidated talk about a specific topic or have something else arranged and vice versa, all right?
yes 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 thank you thank you naresh thank you yes. thank you and uh, then we will close this session huh? thank you thank you thank you okay thank you